I felt somebody owed us some money and I rang I rang him up and said, Listen, if you don't pay me the money, I'm gonna it's gonna be consequences. So, you know, in that sort of world, firearms are pretty much available. I ended up getting hold of one and then ended up shooting. My audience is going to find this fascinating. Okay. Right? To give people some context. Yeah. All right. Now in front of me, mm. I have the successful self-made millionaire. Mm. Owner of the Manjaro's restaurant in Preston, a fitness motivator and property investor. However, the success didn't come without pain and suffering. Ibi spent most of his 20s in prison, had to go through the heartache of his mother passing away whilst in prison. Soon after being released, his brother passed away in a car crash, mentally sending Ibi into a downward spiral of depression. He managed to overcome all of those difficulties and swung the pendulum in the other direction and transformed his life into the successful businessman we see today. Ibi Aslam, thanks for coming onto the podcast, man. Listen, I'm pumped to be here, bro. Yeah. That, was, uh, that was good, that. Was it good, yeah? <laughs> I like it, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. What I like to do, because that's a hell of an intro, absolutely, I agree with you, man. And um, I think a lot of people are going to find your story inspirational, mm. no yeah. doubt about it. But what I like to do, bro, is start from the beginning. Right. You're born and raised in Manchester. Yeah. Longside Beverly Hills. Longside, yeah. <laughs> Clitheroe Road. How would you describe your childhood and upbringing? Okay, so my childhood, my mum and dad was very religious. Okay, so, you know, we were born in an Asian household and they was very Islamic and very strict in terms of protecting us, I would say from, you know, social media, TV, what's out there. At the time, I probably thought that, you know, there was a bit too strict. But looking back at it now, I think from, from what they knew, they was doing the right thing. So, yeah, very strict upbringing. I went to school. We went to, I think, in my high schools, I went to Bromwell High School and then I went to, like, a private school, uh, Islamic school. Dad was quite, you know, he had his set ways of doing things and, you know, traditional family. Don't get me wrong, we were, we were quite well off in terms of anything we wanted, we, he would give us. Like, for example, brand new trainers, um, shopping, you know, every, every other month. But, but the upbringing was very strict. What was your relationship like with your family? Were you close? Yeah, um... What do you mean in terms of close? That's just like, do you confine your dad? Do you talk to him? You, no. you, you mentioned that it's quite strict. Yeah, no. Asian. Yeah, no, not really. He he had his set ways of going about. He had his set ways and set beliefs in terms of how he thought, the you know, what's right. And it was no asking us, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? It was just, this is how it is. This is what I believe that you need to do. And no no questions asked, basically. This is how it is. That's it. It's my way or the highway. That's it. Yeah. That's quite typical for yeah, yeah. first generation <laughs> South Asians, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it was. And then same, obviously, when we was put at, in the mosque, you know, you got teachers and, you know, um, again, it was, you've got to listen to your teachers and it's what they say. And, and that that's it, really. Yeah. So you mentioned you moved to Bramall. Yeah, right. obviously from Longside Beverly Hills yeah, to yeah, yeah. Bramhall. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm saying just I'm being a bit, a bit of tongue in cheek there. Obviously, I'm from yeah. Longside myself, but <laughs> just for the audience purposes, right? Mm. Give a bit of context. Longside now, I would mm. say, is a faith-driven community, and it's got a lot of good people there. I would say, yeah. But it's got a stigma attached to it because uh, once upon a time, there's a lot of gun violence, murders, yeah. drug dealing, all that kind of stuff, and that mm. stigma is sort of still attached today. Yeah. And even surrounding areas like Moss Side, even though Moss Side is a good Somalian community now, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, totally changed. But obviously, that reputation still lingers on. So, when did you move to Bramall? Like, and how did you move to Bramall? Yeah. So, uh, and to be honest, even Manchester's got a bad name, right? From from the nineties, the Gunchester and and stuff like that. But you know, it's all changed now, isn't it? So, yeah. So, my dad was a property. He was in. A, he was. He was a property developer, and it was just earlier on because he had houses and and he and he had a house in Bromwell. He just wanted to, I think from my understanding, I've never asked him actually, but he wanted to just be in an environment where, you know, we had no kind of 
negative influence. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Because if he if he probably seen that there's a lot of problems in Longsight in terms of upbringing and the kids on the streets and that sort of thing, he just probably didn't want us around that. Yeah. So he's thought, I'll take him to Bromall, even though at that time, I can't remember any other. I think it was one other Asian family or something up there, but that was it. Mainly, it was all white British. So that's where he took us, and he thought that the environment would just be a little more, a lot more different to long sight. So I'll just bring him here and just, yeah, that was it. Did you find it difficult to adapt to that community then? Um, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. Uh, but you know, once you start going to school, and you know, then you just start meeting. We, we met a few friends, and then it, it started getting a lot more easier. But again, like he didn't let us out too much, didn't let us interact too much. So it was a bit of a, like I said, strict household, bro. Right. It's like till a certain age, it was like you can't do a lot. Yeah. Um, restricted. Very restricted. So it's like I wanted to sometimes go out, wasn't allowed. Um, so a lot of like, like see a lot of typical youngsters when they, you know, what you, what they can really do. We wasn't allowed to do that. Right. Mm. Okay. You mentioned school there. How did you perform in school academically? Bro, I was really bad at school. I was just up to no good all the time. Um, didn't really want to be there. Again, he didn't press us too much as on homework as well. You know, when you come home and do the homework, didn't press us too much on that. He wasn't really a big fan of going uni as well, college and uni, so he didn't really push us, you know, to do that. His kind of idea was just as long as you can understand the basics, you can then go into business and do something business-related. Wow, that's interesting mm -hmm. because a lot of South Asian parents are like, I want my son to be a doctor. Doctor, yeah, yeah, that yeah. That kind yeah. of vibe. But you, got, you had it good, man, in that sense. In, in that, that sense. In that sense. We, I didn't understand, though, you yeah. know, why, why you know, because everyone was kind of pushing through one thing, you know, let's go high school and college and then uni. Well, he was trying to set us, our, our minds up to do the opposite. Yeah. So I didn't kind of grasp that at the start. Okay. But, um, yeah, but now I understand it a little bit. But, yeah, but what, see, the downfall to that sort of thing is that it just conditions your mind a little bit different. And, you know, you end up being socially de um, detached a little bit, which isn't a good thing. What do you mean? A bit more? Explain a bit more. Yeah, so, like, mm, like you don't really re need friends you start thinking, you know, because we're social animals. We need people to for relationships. We need relationships, whether it's friendship, you know, whatever. Now, I've got to a stage now where, like, if I lose friends or don't have friends, it doesn't really bother me. That's a bit of a scary place to be in because, you know, we all need a little bit of attention from here and there. We all, we all need that friend that we can ring. So it's like I'm not heavily dependent on that. Speaking of friends, mm. they say that yeah. you're the average of the five people you hang around with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was your circle of influence like growing up? You know what? My circle of influence was, it was just mainly kids from mosque who also, whose parents were really, really successful business people. So we used to hang around up there. So they were just normal kids. They weren't like, at this, see, we're talking early, early years here, aren't we? So it's like, it was nothing bad at this point. I think the only bad thing we used to probably do is that if if we wanted to smoke, let's go around the corner and have a little cig. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And 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 that was the probably the only bad thing that we used to do. But no weed or no nothing like that. So overall, yeah, we were pretty, yeah, yeah. You were pretty decent, yeah, yeah, yeah well-behaved yeah. children. Mm. Apart from in school, a little bit rebellious here and there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and I, I think that was to do with. Remember, I was in a school where it was just white crowd so i was the only asian plus i was dark skin as well yeah yeah i'm not saying that i suffered any racism i right. don't think i did it, or nothing that stands out but it was you know you know like you could feel sometimes that you got left out with certain things mm. but um i never really thought about it but yeah all right interesting yeah i can see where your drive comes from then a little mm. bit that's interesting so at this stage any early happenings that determine the direction of your life going forward not really not really um 
I think that was a strict upbringing. He put business in our minds from very young age. He, I think, I think the only then the next, did, like major thing that kind of happened was when my mom and dad kind of broke up. Right. And what age was that? I think I was between ten and fifteen. So maybe I think ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, somewhere down there. How did uh, you take it? I didn't understand it again, but it's just because he had his ways of saying things and he had his ways of doing things where it was no explanation given. And then you were just left to kind of figure sh- stuff out yourself. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, um, I, I, and it all started from, I think my mum my mom started getting a bit ill and then he wanted to go abroad. He had enough of UK. He said, look, I don't want to be in UK no more. I want to go Saudi, Saudi Arabia. That's where I want to go. And that's that, that's where he ended up. But he wanted my mum to come there as well. But my mum didn't want to go because she wasn't well. So we had a decision to make as kids that who are we going to support, mum or dad? So at the start, we did support our dad. But then, like a few years later, we just wanted to come back to UK and just stay with our mum. Right, so you actually did go to Saudi We did Arabia. go Saudi at the start. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not not big by our choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it it was just the way the setup was. It was just like that was our only choice. Yeah. How long were you there for? A few years. Wow. What was went it like? Went to school up there as well, actually. Oh really? Mm, went to school up there, learned a bit of Arabic. So these things have an impact, you know, on a child when you're getting grown up, bro. Because you now I'm in a Saudi Arabia in, a, in an environment where you can't really do even more. You're very restricted even more now. And your mum's up here. So it, it was it was a bit of a crazy time, to be honest. I think um, that probably has an impact on how me and my brothers and my probably sister are today. Because it does condition you as a ch- child differently. How uh, so? Um, because it's not a normal upbringing, is it? So you just gain like a bit more tougher skin, thick skin. You become a bit more cold, a little bit in terms of your feelings. Your feelings get shut off, and you know it just. You know what it does? It kind of forces you to think outside the box from a very, very young age, where a lot of people don't probably start thinking. They probably don't even think till the late teens or late twenties or something like that. So where that forces you to think different things, like, because you see other kids and they've got it different, and then you think. Well, what's going on up here? It seems to me like everything in terms of money and, you know, that sort of thing was all good. But when it was down to the mental things, the basic things, the family union, that wasn't there. Does does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's starting to make sense. Mm. So when you came back to the UK, what was the next few years like? So came back to UK, remember that my dad's brought us to visit our mum now. So he's thinking that we're all going to go back now after like, uh, you know, two, three months or something. But when we've come back here, then I think after that, we didn't go back. We kind of fought because I was a little bit older then. So we fought to stay here with our mum then at that point. You know, I think I I ran away from my house at one point um, because he said, you know, you're going to go. I'm going to take his back and we didn't want to go back to Saudi. So I think I ran away from the house. So when you ran away, what was the plan? Where did you go? Bro, I, I think I just got, tra- <laughs> I think I got a train to Leeds or somewhere. Right. Um, and they all found, where's he be gone? Oh, he's gone. Where? He's just, he's just gone. So I, he then got some elders involved. Then I spoke to them on a mobile and said, look, I'm not coming home till he, I get some assurances from someone that I'm not going to get took. Um, to Saudi. Abroad, to Saudi, yeah. Um, and I, I think I had to, st- I, I, for me doing that, then it gave my little brothers a bit more confidence. Right, right. You so know, you, you sound like you're quite close with your siblings though. Yeah, yeah, we're close. Yeah. We're close, we're very close. Um, when I mean close, like, we pick up the phone whenever we need to. Obviously, as you get older, life takes over and that sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, I'm in regular contact, we're in group chats and that sort of thing. So we all know what's going on. Standard family WhatsApp yeah, yeah. group, innit? Yeah, yeah. What series of events took place leading you to be imprisoned? Yeah, yeah. So from I think from then on, on onwards, when I took that stance and run away from the house and come back, um, I think he wasn't happy about that. 
So because he wasn't happy about that, he then kind of didn't support us financially at that point, left us to do what we want to do um, at, at our pace, you know, whatever we want to do. And it was just from there because I was lost. I was the eldest and suddenly there was no financial support no more from your parents. I had to just, so I started looking towards the streets and I thought, well, you know, because then I started looking at people and thought, well, you know, all the local, you know, drug dealers and that sort of thing. And I thought, you know what, that's cool. That's what I want to do. They've got the money, they've got the cars, they've got everything. And I think that's what led me down that path. So then I started making new friends on on the streets and, you know, started selling weed and started getting, you know, selling drugs and that sort of thing and just getting involved in crime then. And then I was always the type of person who I'm all in or all out. So it's like if any if there's any trouble, I'm first there. If it's, you know, anything that needs to happen, any I'm always there. So putting myself in, you know, in, in the line of fire type thing. Um and that then eventually led us down a path where, you know, we I ended up picking up a firearm and shooting up a house and just doing crazy stuff, bro. Um, and that ended up getting my first jail sentence, really. What was the story behind the firearm? Um, it was, it was, you know, again, it was. That's not a little thing like weed. Yeah, yeah. So we were doing weed. We were selling money. We were making money, and then it was basically. Um, I felt somebody owed us some money and I rang, I rang him up and said, listen, you give me that money or um, um, if you don't pay me the money, I'm gonna, it's going to be consequences. And they didn't really take me that seriously, but I was only young. So, you know, in, in, in that sort of world, firearms are pretty much available. So I ended up getting hold of one and then ended up shooting the house up in terms of scaring them right by saying listen if you don't pay up next time it's going to be a lot more worse that that was that was that my was your thought process thought process do you get me so but that so that that did work initially because what happened was they said okay okay we'll pay you the money however it's a large sum of money because it was it was they said it was 50k at the time and they said look we need a week. We need a week to pay it. So I said, all right, sweet. So I thought, fuck it, flipping alleys worked. Anyway, so that week, there was li liaising with the police mm. to kind of set a trap for me to come back and then get me arrested. Do you get me? Absolutely. So, so set, what I set up, basically. Basically set me up. So, so, so then, obviously, remember, we was in regular contact then. Like, come on, you've got five days left, you've got three days left, you've got two days left, you've got one day left. To, or, okay, tomorrow. So then I've, we've given an address where the money needs to be dropped off. Right. Um, you know what it is, bro? I'm not even proud of these things, but, you know, because since you're asking me a bit, you want to know the deep ins and outs, uh, you know, I'll give it to you. So, you know, but looking back at it now, it's stupid, crazy stuff, in it? Like, I'm, I'm looking back at it where I am today and I'm thinking, flipping hell, did I really do that? But it's crazy because sometimes that's how it, it was just life, right? So then I ended up on the day of when I thought I was going to get the money. I've given an address. I've, what I thought was, I thought I'll send somebody to go and pick it up and I'll give them five grand. So police was surveillance me from the night before because they knew where it lived, right? So they were watching my movement that night till that next day, full 24 hours surveillance. So they knew what I was up to that that morning. They had my number so they could cell site me to know exactly which areas I was in. But remember, I was in that area the night before because I was also doing surveillance thinking, like, well, where's the money going to get dropped off? Oh, it's going to get dropped off here. Okay, so I'll send this guy to go and pick it up. And then, you know, I'll wait here and then he's going to walk from there to there and then I'll pick him up from there and then, you know, we'll get off and that's it. We've got our dough, yeah? This is how I was thinking. Anyway, I was getting surveillance and then um, the next day, the guy did go and pick the money up. So he went and picked the bag up. So, uh, so I'm watching from this angle because it was in Cheadle. Mm. 
So where it was in Cheadle, it was like I could be parked somewhere. I could watch the guy come and drop the money off. The guy could go and pick it up, and I'm watching everything. So that's what's happened. He's, he, he, he used to drive a uh, Mercedes, so he's, he's pulled up. I've seen him literally get out, bag out of the boot, put it on this spot. So I'm thinking, that's the money. So I'm then ringing my guy up and saying, listen, go and pick the money up. It's been, it's been dropped. But police is watching everything. So he's gone and then picked the bag up. And I'm thinking, oh, no one's been arrested. So it must be all sweet. So he's walked down the road for a good 10 minutes. Now, the plan was that he was going to go to a certain house and I was going to meet him at the house. But I got impatient because I'm thinking, this guy's picked up 50 Gs, yeah? I don't know him really that well. You know, you don't know greed can take over, right? I'm thinking, imagine this guy does me over now. So then I'm thinking, all right, well, he's had the bag in his hand for 10 minutes now. He's, he was walking towards the house. So then what I done was I didn't let him get to the house. So I literally, like, pulled up at the lights and I seen him go, yo, bro, jump in, jump in, jump in. You're sweet. You've not been touched for five minutes because you've been walking for five, six minutes now. As soon as he jumped in the car, um... We've pulled over at the, you know, the village hotel in Cheadle. Yeah. Okay, so I've pulled up in the car park to give him his five grand. So when I've opened the, when, so he's put the bag in the boot. I've got out the car. I've opened the bag in the back, literally opened the bag to give him his five grand so he can get off. As I've opened the bag, I've realized that it's, it's not real money. Oh, snap. Bro, I've realized it's not real money. And I, and I thought, this is not real. But as I'm processing that information, and I think I noticed some dye, some dye on there. So police put some dye on there. So whoever opens the bag, the fingerprints are going to be on there. So as I'm realizing that processing this, like my mind's just doing a thousand miles per hour. Next minute, police pull up. Literally got me in the in the act. He sat in the front. I'm sat in the back. All happened so fast. I'm standing that, in the from back. That point, from that so point, fast. it was yeah, firearms. Get on the floor. Get on the floor. And that was it. Then he said, "I said, what? What you arresting me for? He goes, you know, you've been arrested for." <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. So, wow, what a story, man. Uh, that was the first time. But from then, then I didn't see no daylight. It was straight lock up. Cause oh was, really? Yeah, because it was a even though it was my first offence. Um, it was pretty serious in terms of how they seen it. So I just got remanded and then done my time in terms of remand that lasted about a year and a half. And then um, ended up getting chill after that. Uh, I got I, I got eight years. But, you know, bro, this is what I'm trying to say. Like, look, you know, most people that are, that offend, they, they, they first start with a theft. Then they go do a little bit more. Then they do a little bit more. Then they, they don't just land into a serious crime like that. So for me, like, I wasn't a prolific offender. We were brought up good. It's just, you know, life and, you know, circumstances and just being at the wrong place and took me around the wrong path, and I thought that was cool. But it's the most stupidest thing ever, like... Um, yeah, and that led me to doing that, and then I was inside for eight years, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Speaking about family early on, yeah, how yeah. did they take it, your dad especially? Yeah, um, remember he was abroad... Um, so I don't know how he really, really felt in terms of, uh, I don't know how he really, really felt, but you know, he didn't, he didn't say anything bad. He just, he just kind of expressed his like, like we just, you just have to get through the system now. Um, and, and he's just praying and just, yeah, I didn't hear anything bad or anything good. It was just like, he was just probably shocked and, you know, um, probably thinking that where where did he go wrong, right? Yeah, possibly. Uh, or uh, as a father, because if that was my son and he ended up in jail and I've done all my life, I've tried my best to make sure they don't go down that path. I'm thinking, shit, man, where, where did I go wrong? Well, that's how I would look at it. I don't know how he looked at it, but he never said anything bad or good. Okay. Mm. When you went in prison the first night? Yeah. What was you thinking, man? Were you thinking, oh, how the hell did I get here? Yeah, because, yeah, and it was just going through the system and then I got put in a jail cell. I got given these blue plates because that's where everyone has blue plates and then mattress and then I didn't have no clothes or anything like that. It was just under... It, bro, I had to grow up very fast just to understand how system was work. And then everyone's just asking you what you're in for, what you're in for, what you're in for, and you're telling everyone what you're in for. And then everyone's giving you their opinion on how long you may get in jail. 
Mm. So everyone becomes a barrister, everyone becomes a solicitor, everyone becomes a judge. So then I'm asking everyone, how long do you think I'm going to get? And people are like, listen, bro, that's a serious charge that even guys that were doing time, they were saying that like, well, you're going to get 10 years or something for that. So in my head, from the very second day, I started learning that I'm going to get 10 years. I was like, no way I'm doing fucking 10 years in here. Yeah. Fuck it, I'm still like touching 19 or something. I'm like, I'm going to do 10 years. Well, that's half of that. I'm thinking I'm going to come out when I'm 25. Fuck that. You know, I'm not doing that. But anyway, it was it was just, that was in my mind that then it was ten years, eight years, nine years. That's what everyone was telling me. Um, but yeah, but then when I did get my sentence, eventually it was like eight years. Yeah, oh, eight years. Yeah, but I remember I was conditioned then. I was ready for it type thing because by the time I'd been locked up and by the time I got the sentence, it was like a year and a half. God, yeah. So what's it like in prison, man? Adapting to prison life? What's the routine like? You wake up, what happens? Bro, it's a very strict routine. Yeah. Very, very strict routine in terms of you have to wake up in the morning, stand by the door at eight o'clock. Everyone gets counted, meaning like overnight no one's run off. Yeah. So the jail officers come and do a count like one, two, three, four to make sure that they've got the right amount of prisoners in there. Then in the morning they give you a milk and they give you like a little cereal pack like a little small one, uh, that's your breakfast. Um, then at nine o'clock, um, so you have like an hour, you can get like a little shower or something. If you need a shower, you can ring home. Then at nine o'clock, everyone goes to work. Bro, it's like a proper world. Regimented. It's like a world within the world. Right, right. Right, so it's like when you're in prison, you don't really think about outside world. Really? No, because it'll, it'll just do your head in. You know, if me and you know now we're locked up in this room for the next 12 months, mm. if we every day, oh, well, how, how can we get out? How it's, it's gonna, We're going to go down. But if we start thinking, right, you know what? Okay, well, that's your corner. That's my corner. We'll, we'll get into a routine now. I'll read my books in the morning. And then, you know, you, you know what I mean? You start kind of thinking differently. And that's how you have to think. Um, everyone goes to work 9 o'clock. Everyone comes back at 12 o'clock. You get your lunch, you get like locked up then behind your door for two hours. Then you get opened back up at two. You go to work again. You come back at five. Um, you get locked up behind your door again. Six o'clock, you get opened up for canteen, meaning like your food again. Um, and then you get like one hour social time where people can play pool, ring home, get a shower. And then you get locked back up at half seven. Um, and then next day, same routine, same routine, same routine. Um, you have different jobs in prisons. Like some people are in the education department learning English and maths. You know, some people are um, cleaners. Some people are um, working in the kitchen, like as chefs cooking the food. Some people are the gym orderlies. So some people are outside in the garden. So you have different jobs within a prison and, and the prisoners have to do them. So it sounded like your mind was occupied. Yeah, yeah my, your sentence. my mind was occupied. I, I, I think my first sentence, I can't remember what I was doing the first sentence. I think I was in the kitchen. Um, yeah, but my second sentence, I was in the gym. I was, I, was, um, I was a gym orderly, second sentence. What would you say the hardest part of, of being in prison is? Um, bro, the, the hardest part of being in prison, is, it's hard to nail down one, but just your freedom. You know, you can't have the basic things what you want. You're not, you know, you're kind of not really making no progression in terms of financially. You know, for a lot of people, some people don't get me wrong, really smart at making money from inside prison. But for majority of the people, it's, you know, that's all they know then. You can't see your family, you can't see loved ones. You know, it depends what, what freedom means to you individually, right? But um, I, I'll tell you this much, some people can't wait to go back into prison because they feel safe there. You know, some people like who are, who haven't got a house, they're having not good out here. They can't wait to go back into prison. I remember when I was in jail the second time and this time I was doing a longer term, I seen like people come back in three times while I'm still in there. And they're asking me, am I still here? And I'm saying, bro, <laughs> you're asking me if I'm still here. What are you doing back here? What are you doing back here? Exactly. Do you know what I mean? But wow. it's crazy. But they just find comfort there. Why? Because it's regimented. It's in a. It's a routine. You get your food free. You get your, you know, education. So it's almost like a rehab for some people. 
insane. It's mad. So people, a lot of people go back in prison because they feel like, okay, I need to get my shit back in order. Let's go back in prison for a bit. I guess that's where the term comes from, institutionalised, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Was your family coming to see you at this point in and out? Yeah, my first sentence, I got thrown all over the country and it was... um, when they could come, they, on average, I was getting like one visit a month um, from my family. And then I was getting visits from other people as well, like once a week. So you can have one visit a week, I think. One visit a week, sometimes two. So yeah, they were pretty packed up. Yeah, so you gave a nice overview of prison life over the last five years you've been there. Four years, how, how long would you yeah, there so my first in Yeah, sen- so my first sentence has done four years. Okay. And then in my second sentence, I've done longer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or a similar kind of routine... Similar kind of story yeah, in that si- sense. Uh, yeah, similar similar kind of routine. I, w- I was a gym orderly this time, though. So I was right. working in the gym, which was a nice, cushy place to be because I could use the gym every day. Uh, I was out a lot more. So th- that was good for me. I like that, yeah. Okay, so when you say second offence, sorry, just to be just to clarify for the audience, did you come out and go back in again? Yeah. Okay, so... So I come out when I was... Let's talk about the second time. So I come out when I was 24. Right. Just before I come out, my mum passed away. Okay. Before we go to the second offence then, yeah, talk me through yeah. the events leading to your mother's death. Yeah, yeah. So she was ill anyway, and I was in prison, and it was just... I knew she was unwell. She just woke up one day, and she was doing gardening, and she just had a stroke, so she just fell. That's that's the story I got from my brother. I think my sister was there, my brother was there, and she just fell, and they rang up the ambulance to take her to the hospital. And they said that she's had a first stroke. Eventually, we found out she she had a first stroke, which means that there's a bleed in the in in the in the nerve, and that's how you end up getting your first stroke. So I was in I was in prison. The chaplain could come over to me. He was a priest. He said, "Look, I need to speak to you. You need to come to the chaplain." So I said, "Yeah, come on." I knew he wasn't something good, but I just didn't know what he was. So he just basically dropped it to me. He said that your mum's seriously seriously ill. She's in the hospital. She might not be able to make it. We've just had a phone call from the hospital to let you know that, you know, that the next time we come to see you, that you might be, we might have to take you to the funeral or the burial. Basically, he just dropped it to me like that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I said, all right, okay. But again, I was the eldest. So I was like, remember, I've done time inside now. My mind's a little bit different. So it was really, really, you know, I just had to swallow it, really at that point and just go back. I rang at home and I spoke to my brother. They said, yeah, mum's in hospital. She's not talking. Um, she's now been, then, then as I was finding out what was going on, she's been induced to coma. Um, they're doing surgery today. It's not looking too well. And then eventually like six, seven days later, they said that, yeah, we, 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 we have to turn the machines off. And so that meant that then the natural process of death was literally seconds away or minutes away. So then for me, it was, um, I said, well, okay, are you going to take me to, they said, well, we can take you either to the burial or the funeral, but we can't tell you where we're going to take you. That's that's how it was. We'll take you in handcuffs. So, um, yeah, so from there, it was, um, they, uh, it, it was kind, I think they let me go to both places. Um, from what I can remember, but it was straight back. Um, yeah. How was your feeling, man? You know what, bro? It, it was just a sad day. It was just a really, really sad day. You know, your mum passed away and, you know, I'm the eldest and I'm looking at my brothers and my sisters and I'm thinking, you know what, fucking hell, like, where did we all go wrong? You know, it was more of a reflection on... This is how I see it anyway. I just see more of a reflection on... You know, that's not normal. That's not good, is it? Like, so somewhere, somewhere, something's gone wrong, you know, and who's to blame for that? You know, because I always, with me, anything that happens in life, I'm always self-reflecting me. So I'm like, well, could I have done something different? Could I have something done, you know? So, yeah, it was it it, was it. And, And plus, you know, we've got faith, haven't we? Yeah. Like I'm a Muslim. So I do heavily believe in, look, we, we have come in this world to eventually go. We're all passengers. So I think that plays a huge part because, you know, you begin to think that, you know, that's reality. So it's like you, ha- you have faith in your religion and you know that, well, this was going to come. It's just sad that it's come while she's still young. 
So you mentioned there's something about reflection and stuff like that. So mm. I imagine after that point, there was a deep contemplation, reflection. Yeah, yeah, there was. Um, after that point, I then was going to come out of jail. Wasn't long left. So as I did come out, bro, I just turned from getting good to even worse. <laughs> I just become more rebellious. Why? I don't know. I think it was just because my mum had passed away. I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose now. I can just go a bit more crazy in what I'm doing. And plus, I didn't know what else to do. Um, I was still at that age of 24. I was just thinking, I just thought, look, I've been in prison now. I've earned more respect in terms of in the in the criminality world. That's all I knew how to make money. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go back in there and just just leverage that. Really? That was your mindset? Your yeah. first few thoughts coming out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I, so I'm going to leverage that. Right. Because I, I thought, I know what to do there. I know how to, you know... Um, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm speculating here, but mm. was you like bitter towards the world, like in prison, no, none of that, or just literally what you just said there? Like, no, you know what? no, I don't think it was bitter. Um, I think it was just the only path I knew. Right. And the only environment that kind of my fr so-called friends, that who I thought was friends, were doing the same thing. So it was just more a natural path to do that. Okay. So yeah. talk to me what happened in the next few months, years, yeah, so to bro, lead you back in. <laughs> Years, it, it was months. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those guys are you were saying to, what are you doing back here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same thing happened to you in yeah, some ways, so, isn't so, it? So, so I was literally out there for a few months, and as soon as I come out, I think it was the second day, I started going crazy a little bit out there. Started committing violent violence again. It, but we, it's like drug dealers fighting drug dealers, and it was just more, you know, who who owes who money. Let's just go and try to get it back. And that led to violence and stuff, stupid, dumb shit again. So within a few months, bro, I was back locked in. Yeah, it was it was crazy happening, you know, in Burnage. And then, again, none of my own, it was none of my shit. No one owed me money. It was somebody else and it was just, we just got involved. And then we ended up uh, getting locked back up again. Again, not another story that I'm not proud of. Uh, but this time, they left me in remand for like, I think nearly two years. What was the specific offence? Um, it, it was somebody... It, oh, my, my offence. The second one, yeah. Yeah, it was conspiracy to kidnap, conspiracy to blackmail. So that means that we basically we bundled somebody in the car and asked him to pay us money and he because he didn't. And then we ended up getting grabbed for that. He ended up doing it for conspiracy to kidnap and conspiracy to blackmail because you're asking him for, you know... Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So you're back in prison. Back in prison. How long were you there this time? This time I got nine and a half years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So half of that? Half of that. So that's where the, the story comes from, spending most of your 20s in Yeah, yeah, so prison. I spent nearly 10 years in prison, bro. Yeah. But it was that it was in that jail sentence when after my second year, I started reading books. I started focusing more on fitness, you know, become a gym orderly. And I started, you know, realizing that, come on, you be man. Like, you're the eldest. You've left your mum's gone. You you know you you know you got little brothers. You got to take a little bit. You got to man up a little bit. And you got to take responsibility. And you got to know you got to know how to see from what's right and what's wrong. Especially because I've had a good upbringing. I knew that you know you know we all know when we do something wrong, right? So he was like, "Come on, they're not your real friends." So I quickly realized that a few years in, and it was just really then just working on myself to mentally to and just building my personal development up just just becoming a better person started praying and just working on myself really fast forwarding to when you come out this time yeah there was another unfortunate calamity yeah 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 which was the death of your younger brother yes yeah can you walk us through that one yeah so my, my i think at the time i wasn't fully out so I was just, I think it was in an open jail from what I can remember. So what happened was my my younger brother, my youngest baby brother, Hamza, his name is, he was going to a wedding, right? And, you know, youngster is 19 years old. And what, what do they all do? They hire a car. So they hire a car for their best friend's wedding. And on that, on that night when they went to the wedding, after the wedding, they wanted to drive the car for a bit because they paid for it, right? So when they've paid for the car, they were literally driving around. 
And I think they picked somebody up who didn't go to the wedding. And he wanted to drive the car. So they give him the car to drive. And he was driving up and down Wilbraham Road, you know, in Charlton. Yes, near the school. Near the school. So he was just driving. And it was, I think, 2 in the morning or something. And the the the, the police seen him, or they seen the police. So as they seen the police, they put their foot down. They thought, shit, we're going to get pulled over. We've got weed in the car. I think that was the situation. So as they're driving, and you know when you cross over from Princess, as you cross over that Princess Parkway towards where Wally Range High School is on the left, driving so fast, it's got that dip on it. Yes. So they've driven like so crazily fast where I think the dip, as they've lost control. So as they've lost control, they've gone and hit into the lamppost. So when they've hit into the lamppost, the driver survived, but everybody else in that car, I think there were four, four kids, yeah, all died on the spot. And my brother was one of them. So it was, the other kid was called Hamza as well. My brother was called Hamza. Um, and then it was another kid, I forgot his name. Yeah, so anyway, they died on the spot, bro. They literally died on the spot. And we got a call at six in the morning by the police. Remember, I'm still on, I think I was on home leave. So when I've got a knock on the door at six in the morning, I'm thinking that it's, you could, it was a police knock on. So I'm thinking, what have I done wrong now? So I've opened the door and the police said, well, we need to come inside and speak to you. So I said, yeah, well, just come in. They've sat in the lounge and said, we need everybody down here, all your family members down here. So I'm thinking, what the fuck's happened now? But in my mind, I'm thinking, my brother come back from the wedding. He's probably asleep in his room. So I'm shouting his name, saying, saying come on, everyone come down. Because I'm frustrated now. What the, what, what's police doing here waking us all up at six in the morning? So as they've sat us all down, when my sister's come down, my brother's come down, and I'm thinking, Hamza's not here. But at that point, I don't think I still thought of anything. But then they've gone, oh, unfortunately, we just need to let you know that your brother, little brother Hamza, he just had a car accident and he's died on the spot. Because obviously, they, they, that's how they deliver their news. It's no, um, uh, got something to tell you here, by the way. What, um, don't know how to say this to you, but, you know, they just deliver it, bro. Yeah. It's direct and straight. Um, and at that point, I was like, fuck. Like, but then I'm thinking, I've got to go back in jail tomorrow. So I'm leaving my brothers and, you know, sisters again. You know, to deal with the aftermath of uh, um, someone passing away, you know, it's so much to do, isn't it? You know, dealing with paperwork and then the funeral aspect of it. And then it's, uh, you know, you know, family gatherings and all that that happens afterwards. So again, I had to go back in prison. But, um, you know, we had some certain, you know, family members that were there and, you know, they was there to help. But again, yeah, that was that situation, bro. My, 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 my little brother passed away basically just like that. That's mental, bro. Like, yeah. you just... I'm assuming grieved one process. You know, yeah, yeah, not even over that, and then this happens, and then this happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that was that the start of your of you going into depression, mentally breaking down? Would you say? Or? No, no. I w firstly depression. I don't really believe in depression, bro. Okay. Right. Let me just say that straight now. Um, maybe years ago I was like, what is? I was already. I was probably questioning what is depression, but right now I, I really believe that what you focus on comes towards you. So if you really want to change and if you really want better for yourself, you can do that. So, you know, it wasn't really depression. It was just more God's testing you more now. He's, you know, he tests his most beloved ones, right? So I'm like, and he never puts enough, he only puts the pressure on you what you can handle, right? So he was like, okay, maybe I can handle this as well. That was so, your mindset. Yeah, yeah. So what's more, what's what's gonna come now again? What 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 more is it to come that I have to handle? So it was more towards like receiving it, and then thinking, right, how can I spin this in a positive kind of way? So it's like, okay, well, because I've never really been the one too much now, especially in the last uh, ten years. I've never really been the one to focus on what's going wrong. It's like, if anything's going wrong, well, how can we make that right? Or what's what's going right? Let's just keep focusing on that. So it was just it was just more like I was again feeling a little bit bad for my little brothers and my sisters, and I've had to go back in prison. But hopefully, then I was like, oh, well, I'm gonna be out soon, and you know, I'm on the phone to them, and we can make things work. Okay. Yeah. So w when you did eventually come out, yeah, you know, looking at doing a bit of research, you did fall into a bit of a rut. You can say, yeah, gaining a bit of weight. 
let yourself yeah, go yes, a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. So when I come out, I was literally like ripped when I first come out. Then 12 months after that, I just let myself go because I was just like, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. It was, um, you know, I let myself go. So I put the weight back on, like a lot of weight back on. And and it was bro, it was just one day. I think I was just woke up after like fifteen months or something, and I thought, you know what, I'm making this change today. I'm gonna ring some PTs up because clearly what I'm doing isn't working. So I need some help. So then I I I, I, I think I googled or I checked a few pages and I got in touch with Ultimate Performance and another guy called Carlton. Carlton McIntosh. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't really know them, but it was just more. Just, I just want to get help from the best in the game. And then I got hired both of them just to give me the knowledge to game basically what I need to do to to lose my weight and just get in the best shape possible, really. It's interesting that you reached out to someone mm. because you've got a qualification in personal training. Yes. So that's quite interesting. Yes, bro, because, you know, knowledge is, you know, is good. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you've got to get the help from the right people, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I always say to people like knowledge is power, right? But the application of knowledge is more power. So you can sit here, read a book. doesn't mean you know what to do. You then have to go and do it. And once you go and do it, that's when you're going to know like what's good, what's not. So there's no point in reading the book. So I just had read the book. Right. So it was more than getting knowledge and getting around people that are practicing that then. Yeah. And then they would then put me in the right direction or, yeah. Interesting, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, because it's a, it's, a, it's a lesson as well. Sometimes you need to reach out to people. Of course, of course, of course. Don't be afraid to do that. No, 100%, definitely. That, and that's what, this is where people always sit there and just always cry about things, right? But really, what's the, who have they reached out to? What moves have they made, really? Who have they sent them DMs to? If they haven't, then they can't really complain, right? Yeah, absolutely. And when you said before, you don't really believe in depression, it reminded me a little bit of Andrew Tate, man. You know, his philosophy going Does forward. Does he say that? Yeah, yeah. So Andrew Tate, I know you had uh, someone yeah, on yeah, your yeah. podcast speaking mm. about him in prison and stuff like that. But that's yeah. just a side note, basically. So Yeah. But where does this depression come from? Like, I think it's just a, like, I, I don't really know where it comes from. The reason why I'm saying it, people are going to give us a lot of stick for believing or having that mentality. I mean, for me, um, mm. I've not been half of the things that you've been through. Yeah, so yeah. I'm on the fence a little bit about it. And yeah, I've, yeah, I've never yeah. experienced depression. But someone like yourself mm. that's been through a lot and saying that might be some truth to it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, bro, look, most of my life from my from my got jail, I've done everything under pressure, right? I've been under huge pressure, like from getting locked up as an eldest, just in prison, not knowing how to handle stuff. So everything from then, from 19 till now, 35, everything's been under pressure that I've done, right? I've never felt through that 16 years that I ever wanted to kill myself. I've never felt that. Now, I don't know if that faith has got something to play in that. Yes, I felt bad days. I felt down days. I felt like, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm just really stuck here. I'm really lost here, you know, but I've always just trusted the process. Like I've always thought, look, God's got a bigger plan. You know, if I, you know, it depends what the problem is, right? But, it, you know, if you, fo if you, we've got a problem right now, like uh, on anything, if we focus on the problem, the problem becomes bigger. If you focus on the solution, you know, you find a path to get to the solution faster. So it's just all about, you know, your perspective on things and how you look to see things in it. Yeah. And we're seeing that, obviously, the shift in mindset. So now I'm seeing it be that's yeah, yeah, business yeah, yeah, owner, yeah. stuff like that. So when you came out, bro, right? Yeah. Um, how long was it till you made, you know, a success of yourself, would you say? Look, first of all, like I was already doing a bit of business while I was in prison. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Even we're though it wasn't. Yeah. Bro, I had burger mm. vans. Interesting. Yeah. But, it, you know, I had left them to people to um, to basically run. And they weren't doing that well. You know, some days they were, some days they, they was doing well, some days they wasn't. Because they just didn't know how to run the business. But, you know, I couldn't really expect too much from them. So I think it was like towards the end of my sentence, I just told them to sell it. And then I had money invested with other people as well, like, I, I, before I got locked up, I had some people that I could trust because I had made money. So it was like, 
you do what you're doing with it. And when I come out, just give me like 10% return. So when I come out, I did have some money. And then it was just basically what I wanted to do, really, what path I wanted to pick. Um, and the other good thing was because I was brought up in a good household, I could easily raise money, which a lot of people can't do. You know, all they struggle to do at the start of their career. I had a good network of people where I could literally go to people and ask them for money and they would give it to me because, you know, I could talk. They knew that I knew what I was going to do with it. And, you know, that trust was there. So I've been really blessed that I've always had that. So I think that's like, uh, that's a bit of a privileged position to be in because not everyone has that. So that I've been blessed with that sort of thing. Where, where did uh, Manjaro's come from during this mix? Yeah, so Manjaro's, bro, when I then came out of prison, my one of my friends, he, he's got Manjaro's in Birmingham. So he basically said to me, well, I'll introduce you to the owners. Um, and this is a great franchise model. You can make really, really good money from this. Uh, you know, the investment's around half a million quid, just short of that, depending on the location. And, you know, you can generate good cash from it. The only thing you will need to learn is, you know, leadership skills, management skills, business skills, and, you know, that sort of thing, which I had already done a lot of work on uh, while I was in prison with personal development work and business work. And remember, I've been brought up in a household that was, you know, my dad was in a, a businessman, so I knew, like, a little bit. So it was just more learning on the job but using my past experience to help me deal with day-to-day -day things. Okay, so out of all your businesses, Manjaro's, yep. you're a property investor now. You yeah. even got a podcast coming out. Yeah. A lot of things, a lot of fingers in pies. Which one is bringing you the most profit return of investment? Um, yeah, so so with the podcasting, that's more towards, uh, that's more of a bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's branding and, you know, just getting message out there. So that's not really generating me any cash. I'll tell you this much. Since I've launched that podcast, I've had a lot of companies reach out to me saying to me, can, can we sponsor you? Can we do this? And they've, some of them have offered me crazy money for some of the things. Already? You just started off? Bro, they have, right? Amazing. But I don't believe in what they've offered me in terms of, you know, like, there's a porn site that got in touch. Oh, my God, really? Right. Yeah, so it's like you're questioning your morals, aren't you? But it's like they have other agendas behind it. Yeah, yeah. They know who you, who, who you are. They know I'm a, I'm a man of faith, yeah? And then they offer you silly money to say certain things. So it's like if you're not successful, like, if you care about money at that point, a lot of people would buy into that just for, like, 5K a month or 10K a month. It's borderline selling your soul, though, isn't it? Exactly. So, like, a few companies I've reached out, but I've just, I'm not interested. So, that's that. But where my mo most money comes in from, bro, is when, and now the coaching I do with business and mindset, that's where my, most of my money comes from is mindset and business coaching. So, run me through your coaching business. What is it? What type of service do you provide? Yeah, so... It's literally I help coaches, CEOs, or high-level entrepreneurs that earn over a hundred grand a year. I'll show them ways how they can double their income with the help of mindset and just basic business principles, bro. A lot of people don't even know the basic principles, and it's just basically we sit them down and look at their business, whether it's through marketing, certain mind mindset shifts in terms of you know, because these bosses and these CEOs themselves sometimes need help. So just a certain perspective or mindset shift can literally elevate the business. But my theory and my messaging behind all that is literally like, get your health in order. Get yourself in the best mind and shape possible and watch your business boom. And once they do that, everything starts to get elevated and better. And then it's basic principles like with businesses, depending on what you want to look at and we go deep in, you know, I do that on personal, you know, coaching services. So that's what I do now. That's where my main money comes in from there. Yeah. And you've got the credential, the experience to back it up as well. Yeah. You've also made a mistakes, you know, losing half a million in business yourself. Yep. Yep. Madness. Yeah. But I've lost more than that, but that was just one part. Like I remember I was in China, bro, and we were up to no good. And, you know, um, it's like someone dropped half a million quid off and it was literally like, it's gone. But what do you mean dropped half a million So we, we were selling weed. Right. Okay. And I was in China, just up to no good. And you know you know how it works in the dark world. Everything's cash, cash, cash. So literally half a million quid cash got dropped off. And it was, I've been robbed. I said, what the fuck do you mean you've been robbed? Then I lost reception for two hours. 
because I was in China coming out of a place and there was no reception for two hours. My mind was like, I can only imagine the bro, frustration. The frustration. I was like, oh, fuck. Now what? Because I owe somebody else money. And then, you know, these sort of things lead to more violence and more stuff. But, you know, when you're on the wrong path, it's like bad things just happen, bro. So this is why, like, my core message to people out there is, like, if you're on the wrong path, you can change. Just gain skills. Get around people who are doing good things and watch how doors open up. You know, th when I say I, I lost half a million quid, that was when I was up to no good. But then in the real business, like, when I'm doing good things, I've still lost money, bro. Like, like I've still lost hundreds and hundreds of grand and, you know, building mistakes and just stupid mistakes. It's part of the process, isn't it's it? It's part of the process. Do you know what, like, do you know with the young guys that are just come out of prison or don't have any direction in life, mm. what would you say the starting point is to turning it all around? Yeah, um, I think that's a really good question, that. The first thing you have to just really kind of watch is your environment. Where are you going back into? So if you're a kid who lives in, I don't want to name some areas, but let's just say not the best areas, right? Let's just say you go back to the same street and you're seeing the same kid who was, you know, who was shot in on the same corner and, you, you know, you're going to see him. You're going to see the same mate who drives that golf, but he's up to no good. No one's changing. You're going to end up back in the same area with the same sort of people. What's going to happen is you're going to end up probably getting influenced by what they're doing. But if you're around people who aspire to better themselves every day, right? Go to certain networking events, or if you want to be a property developer, get around people who do properties, that's what you're going to want to do. So, you know, change your environment. That's what I would say. Move out of your area. Because if you look at all these successful people, most of them, they've become successful by moving out. I mean, even if, for example, Richard Branson or, for example, just look at the big boys, yeah, Bill Gates, these Warren, they don't have an address. They live everywhere, right? They don't have a Pacific address where they live here. They've got like 10 houses in different parts of the world, right? It's like, move out of your area because that's where you're going to fight. That's the first step. Move out of your area. Someone said an interesting quote, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's powerful, that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Bro. Yeah drawing their podcast to a close yeah what's a good piece of advice somebody gave you that helped you in business in in business oh in life to be fair yeah um you know you know what i don't think anyone gave me any just specific advice like that but it was just basically what what i've read is is that make mistakes make mistakes and from mistakes you'll get better it's like people want to have things right but they don't want to do anything right so but really you should do it the opposite way you should become something so you can do something then you'll have the thing but people want to do it the opposite way so in theory you have to change your identity a little bit especially if you know if you want to if you want different things and better things you have to learn to change your identity so it depends what you want in business bro like like for example i i when i transitioned into coaching business coaching, it was like, I had to make a lot of sacrifices there. You know, I, I had to understand the game. I had to become, I, I had to do a lot of more work on myself. And it's like, if you're a good coach, for example, or a good teacher, or a good mentor, you also need a coach because a good coach that doesn't have a coach doesn't deserve to have, you know, be a coach, bro. You have to con constantly be learning and becoming better at what you need to do to you know expand your knowledge base in whatever field you're in yeah and i heard you say touching upon that mm. you have to get out of your comfort zone to do that 100 percent. yeah and people and one of the biggest killers these days is comfort because soon as you know at the start when everyone's struggling a little bit soon as they start earning that first let's just say 500 pound to a grand a month they start getting comfortable then then they want to look at getting better car you know it's just normal comfort it's comfort that kills people. So you have to constantly do something every day that brings you discomfort, right? So if you're not willing to do that, then you're going to stay average. You're going to do what everyone else is doing. But if you are willing to do that to yourself, like put yourself in discomfort situations, whatever it is, you will see results. You will see good results, but people don't do that. Absolutely. 
do you think at this point in mm-hmm. your life you're happy? <laughs> happiness is uh, it's, it's a little bit define that in it define happiness but you know bro look I'm at peace at where I am okay could I be happier probably yes um am I you know but what is happiness right like I'm, I'm on the right path right I'm, I'm doing what I need to be doing yes I could be doing more but I'm constantly working at that but you know I have goals still re- to get to reach but you know overall I'm at peace at the direction I'm moving towards I'll say that it's good, man. I had to throw a deep one in there, innit? Yeah, yeah, I had yeah. To throw that a, is a really deep one, right? To, yeah, 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 yeah. And the supplementary question to that is, what do you think yeah, yeah, are yeah. the ingredients to make a happy life? It's, I think it's individual-based. Um, it's like, if, if you've achieved, you know, if you break life down in, like, what you want to achieve financially, uh, what's, what, what freedom means to you personally, and, you know, your family your loved ones and you know some people want kids they can't have kids now they're not going to be you know that's that's the thing that's going to bug them right so it depends what you want to achieve out of life uh and i feel like have a a little bit of a life plan which people a lot of people don't have again so you need to really go to someone and figure out what your purpose is what your why is why do you do what you do um and 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 figure that stuff out and once you figure that out eventually you will you know if you're moving in the right direction you you know peace and happiness will come towards you bro i agree i think the thing to chase is contentment as opposed to happiness right you yeah. content because you said before interesting phrase i'm at peace mm. i think that should be the goal and then in pursuit of your goals be at peace enjoy the journey man yeah yeah just just yeah that's it what's the best way to reach out to to be coached your social media yeah bro best way to just reach out is just uh you know you can literally either google my name or ibi aslam official is my instagram ibi aslam again youtube i'm not hard to find i'm very easy to find bro awesome bro thank you so much for coming on the podcast man yeah man it's been a belter man keep doing great work bro i think you're doing great work and just keep going and um you're doing great and i hope you get bigger and bigger guests on i'll keep keep an eye on your journey bro Likewise, man. Appreciate yeah. that. With that being said, peace. Thank you. How was it, bro? Honestly, it was amazing.